Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the final Forrester Lecture of the academic year. It's good to see everyone here. Each year, the Dean selects a faculty member who has outstanding research to share, uh, and that's who presents this final lecture of the year traditionally. For the previous academic year, Professor Jeff Webb was selected, but because we were remote after spring break, do you remember that? Uh, we had his lecture earlier this spring instead. The recipient this year, though, is Professor Kent Eilers, uh, who will present tonight. And one final note, um, it's also conventional to have a reception following the faculty Forster lecture, which this is one of, uh, and that will happen this e evening after the, this lecture in Richland Library uh, to honor both of our faculty presenters of the year. And now before I introduce tonight's speaker, um, if Dr. Luke Fetters uh, has volunteered to come and pray for us. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are thankful for the opportunity to join together this evening to exercise our minds and our souls to the serious endeavor of exploring the mysteries of your goodness and your grace. We thank you for Dr. Eilers who has prepared over the course of his lifetime and more specifically over the past weeks and months to guide our thoughts Godward this evening. Just as he has dedicated his heart, soul, and mind to preparing this lecture, may we dedicate our hearts, souls, and minds to attending and may the Holy Spirit guide us and our efforts together this evening into truth. May we understand anew the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. The Reverend Dr. Kent Eilers is professor of theology and has been at Huntington University since 2009. His undergraduate education was at Calvin College. Then he completed graduate studies at Denver Seminary to earn his Master of Divinity. Then the University of Aberdeen in Scotland, where he got a PhD in systematic theology. While completing his undergraduate and graduate education, he served on the staffs of several churches in Michigan and later in Colorado, where he was ordained. Married to his wife since 2000, he and Tammy have two daughters, Hannah and Abigail. They enjoy doing just about anything that gets them outdoors. Dr. Eiler's lecture tonight draws on the research that led to his fourth book, The Grammar of Grace. Dr. Eiler. So we actually have three kids. Uh, I, was, I was invited to look over the bio that was going to be read before I started, and uh, I didn't look over closely enough because uh, our son Samuel uh, was born this last year, uh, and he is being, uh, he's being babysat by our two teenage daughters, so you can pray for all of that right now. That would be great. Uh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Drury for that kind introduction and for chairing the uh, Forrester Lecture Series Committee. Thank you. Uh, a couple other committees deserve some thanks as well. Uh, thank you to the, um, the selection committees that you would honor me with this opportunity. Um, and also to the, the staff of the MCA, Steve and Andrew, you guys do so much work behind the scenes uh, that, that events like this will happen. Uh, so thank you so much. The faculty lectureship is a professor's opportunity to invite you into our research. Uh, I hope to do that this evening. The enduring fascination uh, of my academic work has been the peculiar, utterly unique life uh, that is the Christian life. The formal name for this in theology is sanctification, or simply the Christian life. Uh, on this topic, I've uh, published a couple books uh, and now I'm just beginning another. So tonight I want to explore some new directions. We're going to range widely from uh, recent scholarship on Paul to Santa. Um, and from the icon of the Anastasis to Yoda. 
So uh, let's begin with Yoda. Uh, part one, grammar as life pattern. What do I mean by the word grammar? Language requires a basic set of rules to ensure that communication succeeds. We call those rules grammar. It is the pattern by which we arrange all the parts of our language so they hold together. We can stretch grammar, even break parts of it, but the basic pattern has to hold for language to work. Yoda is a good example. We smile when he speaks because we can still understand him even as he stretches grammar. Yoda says, when 900 years old you reach, look as good you will not. He inverts the subject-verb pair with its object, but we get it. However, if we discard grammar altogether, we get this. Good old as when hundred not reach years will you you hundred look nine. The pattern that holds the parts together is gone entirely. In the same way that grammar holds the parts of a language together, our lives are also held together, you might say, by some grammar. Some basic pattern unifies our sense of self and gives meaning to our actions. For example, when an American soldier swears the oath of enlistment, they establish a grammar of allegiance and duty. Nurses here at HU recite the Florence Nightingale Pledge, establishing a grammar of devoted service and loyalty. A devoted Muslim commits themselves to the first pillar of Islam, and the remaining four pillars establish the grammar of their devotion, prayer, charity, fasting, pilgrimage to Mecca. So, what is the grammar of the Christian life? Let me suggest that the grammar of the Christian life is grace. Ah, that hardly says enough, right? Even though Christianity is known as the religion of grace, we use the word grace so casually in everyday talk. Are we sure that we know what it means in the specific Christian sense? And beyond that, do we know what it would mean for grace to be the pattern, the grammar that holds together and unifies all the parts of a Christian life? Generating a sense of self, giving meaning to our action? That brings me to part two, the Christ gift as grace. The English word grace comes to us from the Latin gratia which translates the Greek word charis. Charis has a wide semantic range. Uh, depending on its context, uh, it can mean favor, beauty, thankfulness, gratitude, delight, goodwill, benefit, or gift. When charis is on the lips of the Apostle Paul, he most often means gift. In some cases, uh, grace names for Paul the gifts that are given by churches or, or the gifts that are given by the Holy Spirit or what God has done in time and space through his Messiah, Jesus. The Christ gift is grace. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus, Romans 3. Now, in his day, Paul was not alone using the language of grace to describe God's gift giving. Among ancient Greek philosophers, grace was a common way to name the gifts of the gods, and the Jews of Paul's day spoke of grace to describe Yahweh's gifts. Uh, take Philo of Alexandria, for instance, a Jewish philosopher alive during the first century. Uh, Philo writes, uh, these are the blessings of good people, who fulfill the law by their actions, blessing which it says will be completed by the grace of the gift-giving God who dignifies and rewards what is excellent because of its likeness to him. So follow. It's not surprising that Paul and other New Testament authors used the word grace to name what God had done in Jesus the Messiah. Ah. But what is surprising 
is the way that Paul describes the Christ's gift as grace. Paying close attention to that is critical if we hope to understand how grace establishes a grammar for the Christian life. Uh, Two recent books by the renowned uh, New Testament scholar John Barclay of Durham University are remarkably helpful. Paul and the Gift, 2015, uh, and Paul and the Power of Grace, 2019. Uh, These have been widely celebrated uh, as among the most significant works on Paul in decades. From my perspective, the brilliance of Barclay's work is the clarity he brings to Paul's use of gift language. Now, that might not seem like a big deal. Uh, Just poke around in the New Testament a little, and you stumble over the basic point time and again. The Christ gift is grace. Ah. But here's the thing. What exactly does Paul mean by gift? Uh, Barclay, he puts the question this way. If Paul configures God's relationship to the world in Christ as gift, what sort of gift is it? How does it work? So we'd be right to conclude that the Christ gift is the ultimate and ideal gift. So what sort of gift is that? And to answer that question, Barclay shows that in different cultures and in different times, the sense of an ideal gift is constructed in different ways. He calls these different ways perfections of grace. Barclay's perfections are his way of categorizing how we might answer the age-old culturally universal question. What makes a gift truly perfect? Ask yourself, just pause, sit back, ask yourself, how do you measure if a gift is truly a gift? How do you know that that thing that was given to you as a gift really is a gift? Does it have to be given with no limits? Or uh, is it only perfect, the true gift, if it expects no return? Or does the perfection of a gift require something of the one who gives it? Most important for us, if God is the ultimate giver, does every possible perfection apply to every one of his gifts? After all, James writes, every good act of giving, every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights in whom there is no variation or shadow due to change, How is the Christ gift perfect? Let me briefly summarize each perfection, then we'll consider what we actually find in Paul. The first perfection is superabundance. A superabundant gift is perfect in the sense that it has no limit. It'll never cease, never fade, never dim. A gift of greater magnitude and extent can't be imagined. Singularity is the second possible perfection of a gift. It describes not the gift itself, but the nature of the giver. When this perfection is applied to a gift, the giver does nothing other than just give gifts. It's the giver's singular operation. Now, Barclay, he finds this in Plato's descriptions of God in which Plato contrasts the one true God with the gods of Greek mythology. Those gods, small g, acted in harmful and destructive ways, but God, for Plato, the highest form of being, would not. The third perfection is priority and concerns the timing of the gift. Um, If you perfect a gift this way, it's prior to any request, given entirely on the initiative of the giver. Incongruity is the fourth perfection. It names the mismatch in worth between the gift and the one who receives it. Assigning this perfection to a gift means that the difference between the giver and the gift and the one who receives it 
is being maximized. Such gifts are given without condition, without regard to your worth. The fifth perfection is efficacy. Now we're talking about the changes that a gift brings about its agency. A gift would be perfect this way if it creates new possibilities, opens new avenues, even removes obstacles. The sixth and final perfection of a gift is non-circularity. There's, not a, there's a word we don't use every day. When a gift is perfect in this sense, Barclay argues, it expects no return. In the ancient world of Jesus, Paul in the early church, he shows it would have been strange to perfect gift giving this way. Giving, receiving, responding to gifts was the universal stuff of social life. Only in the modern era, in the West, have we imagined that a perfect gift wouldn't expect return. Barclay explains, in most cultures and at most times, gifts are part of a circular exchange, an ongoing cycle where the gift is intended to create or maintain a social relationship but a gift is not the end of a relationship. Neither is the return one gives or gives back in order to continue a relationship that is in principle open-ended. Whereas Western modernity, that's us, is inclined to perfect the gift as pure, really a gift, only when there's no reciprocity, no return, no exchange. In other words, it's a very recent way of thinking in the West to imagine that God's gift of Christ, the ultimate giver's most ultimate gift, would expect no return. As it concerns the perfections of grace, what do we find in the writings of Paul? Barclay shows here and there uh, we find superabundance, we find priority, we find some efficacy. But the backbone of the Apostle Paul's portrayal of God's grace in Christ is incongruity. Romans 3, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Paul most often and most strongly presents the Christ gift according to this perfection. Between the Christ gift and the worth of the ones who receive it, there is no fit, no match. This is the driving baseline underneath every other note the apostle plays. Thumping along, consistency without break, pushing everything else forward. 1 Corinthians 1. God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of the world, the despised things, the things that are not, to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him. Paul pictures the incongruity of the Christ gift, sometimes in terms of wisdom and foolishness, seen here, other times as strength and weakness or slavery, freedom, shame, honor, or orphanhood and adoption. And in, in one place in Romans 5, Paul even puzzles over the magnitude of the mismatch. He says, at just the right time, we were still powerless Christ died for the ungodly. And then it's, it's as if as he writes, the strangeness of it from common experience strikes him. And he says, very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So who can you think of who doesn't operate that way? Who can you think of that operates the opposite way? Well, of course it's Santa. <clears throat> he keeps a list. Who's naughty? Who's nice? Santa knows. And if you're nice, well, you can expect a gift. Gifts are given to the worthy ones. But if you're naughty, well, 
you can expect a lump of coal. Santa's gift giving is the opposite of God's. The Christ gift is given while we were still sinners, Barclay summarizes. God's works in the, he works in the absence of worth to create something out of nothing. Now, as, as modern Western folks, uh, we might suppose that the perfection of incongruity requires the perfection of non-circularity, either theologically or conceptually. Non-circularity would mean, because we don't use that word all the time, right? It would mean that the grace of the Christ gift asks nothing of the one who receives it. Since Martin Luther, it's been common among interpreters of Paul to think that way. But when you look at the writing of Paul, non-circularity is just never a perfection he applies to the Christ gift. Galatians 5, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Ephesians 5, follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, walk in the way of love just as Christ loved us. Romans 6, offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness because you're not under law. You're under grace. As Paul presents it to us, the gift of Christ could never be earned, could never be merited, but that doesn't mean that the gift fails to invite your return. Barclay, he puts it this way. The Christ gift is entirely undeserved, but strongly obliging, unconditioned, but not unconditional. It's circular, but only by remaking the human agent who responds to the gift. In another piece, he clarifies, grace does not just invite response, but itself effects the human participation in grace such that every good work can be viewed as the fruit of divine power as much as the product of believers themselves. Okay, we leave Barclay now to pursue a question. Do we find this sort of grace anywhere else in Scripture? I think we do. Time and again, The incongruity of God's grace, the mismatch, is paired with its circularity. We might say that God's grace is God's undeserved gift that awakens transformed life. We find grace of this sort in the creation narratives of Genesis 1 and then 2, God's speech gift, it's the most stark and incongruous of all. The initiative is entirely God's. The world, us, Milky Way, rabbits, robins, oak trees, were all spoken into existence. But the gift is also circular. God makes humanity in his image, which is an invitation to represent God to the world, and the invitation awaits our response. Here I am. Lord, we reject our calling again and again, which is narrated for us in Genesis 3 until Matthew 26. In the Garden of Gethsemane, which Elizabeth Wang uh, beautifully portrays in this piece, Jesus prays in agony. In the Garden, Jesus fulfills our response in our place, yielding his will to the Father, saying, not as I will but as you will. In other words, here I am, Lord. Grace is present when God chooses Abraham to be the father of his missional people. I will make you a great nation, God promises. I'll bless you. I'll make your name great. You will be a blessing. Just look up at the sky. Count the stars. If indeed you can count them, so shall your offspring be. This gift is not won by Abraham, nor could it be. Uh, This 19th century engraving by von Karlsfeld captures Abraham's shock. His hand grips the door of his familiar home as God uproots him and points to the blessing that awaits. The gift, it's an invitation. It awakens, but doesn't compel the appropriate response. Here I am, Lord. 
grace is present when God liberates Israel from Egypt, the order is critical. Only after God delivers them do they receive the law, not before. They're not invited to prove their worth, only their willingness to follow God out from bondage. And the book of Deuteronomy ensures that they don't forget. Deuteronomy 7, the Lord did not set his affection on you and choose you because you were more numerous than other peoples. You were the fewest of all people. But it was because the Lord loved you, kept the oath he swore to your ancestors that he brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the land of slavery. Grace is portrayed in Jesus' parable of the prodigal son. And the way Rembrandt, he paints the scene, we're invited to see ourselves in the wayward son. Resting in his father's embrace, his shoeless feet and rags speak our truth. There is no fit between us and the gift. In the ministry of Jesus, the incongruity of grace is everywhere. He associates with the stigmatized, with the lost, the worthless, with prostitutes, tax collectors, illiterate fishermen, children, women marginalized by illness or ethnicity. Even though Rembrandt doesn't paint or point beyond the Father's welcome, Jesus does. On his lips, grace is anything but cheap. Those forgiven are expected to forgive. Those served are expected to serve. Those with resources are expected to give. Those loved, expected to love. And for those for whom the cross is carried, they're expected to carry theirs. The gift of his calling is an invitation that awakens but does not compel the appropriate response. Here I am, Lord. No wonder the disciples of Jesus panic when they learn he's leaving them and that they would have to enact such a life alone. And Jesus promises the remarkable. The very Spirit of God would live in them, empowering all they could never do on their own. John 14, I will ask the Father, he'll give you another advocate to help you be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. Wait, Jesus, which is it? <laughs> will the Spirit of God come or will you come? Yes, in the mystery of the Godhead, the life of the Spirit simply is and irreducibly is the life of the Son. You know, a couple weeks ago, I sat in a, in a huddle of students puzzling over this passage. And at one point, one of them, she leans back and she says, I wonder if the Spirit felt familiar. I nearly fell out of my chair. <laughs> Her insight was entirely new to me, but it seems entirely right. They had been with Jesus for years. They knew what he felt like, the effect of having him near. And she's just asking, would the feeling, the sense, the effect of having the spirit with them be familiar? Would it elicit in them, oh, you're back. Yes, of course, because the Christ gift is not an idea, not an ethic, not a regime. It's a person. Christ gives himself, thereby drawing the Christian into the presence of God more perfectly than tabernacle or temple ever could. Like I said, I am ranging widely. So we should review what we've gained before we head into part three. First. I began by suggesting that grammar is a useful way to think about the Christian life. Our spoken language has a pattern that ensures our speech is intelligible. Yoda stretches grammar. We smile when he does, but he doesn't break it. So the pattern still holds the parts together. We understand what he means. So too, the Christian life has grammar. It has a particular pattern that makes it intelligible makes it something we can recognize, makes it something you and me can speak less or more fluently. It holds the parts of our life together. 
Second, uh, Barclay's recent scholarship on Paul helped us think about the ways in which a gift might be perfect. Uh, This offered a vantage point for us to appreciate what we find in the Apostle Paul. The Christ gift is perfect, primarily, in its incongruity. Unlike Santa, the worth of the gift does not match the worth of the recipients. Third, Barclay helped us clarify that the perfection of incongruity does not necessarily entail the perfection of non-circularity. And in fact, non-circularity is not a gift perfection. We find anywhere in Paul. The specific sort of grace which is the Christ gift is incongruous and circular. It awakens the response of those who receive it by remaking them. Fourth, I trace those grace dynamics through several examples in the Old Testament and Gospels showing that God's gift giving is transformative and thereby awakens and enables response. Here I am, Lord. Now, these grace dynamics of incongruity and circularity, they point toward a grammar of grace, a pattern to hold the Christian life together, helping us make sense of ourselves and our actions, And let me just suggest that the grammar of grace is proximity and pilgrimage. Uh, With the word proximity, I mean this. The Christian life is the utterly peculiar existence of the one whose place in the cosmos is fundamentally and irreducibly altered by their association with Jesus. Jesus calls it abiding in him, John 15. Likewise, Paul, time and again, refers to the Christian as one who is in Christ. One example of many, Romans 8. In other words, the Christian's geographical and temporal location still marks her as a creature in time and space, but the place that is now most essential, most descriptive of who you are, is that you are now in Christ. Paul, he describes this uh, dramatic alteration with a family metaphor quite a lot, adoption. Our change in status is like a change in family of origin. Adopted into God's family, the Christian man or woman is elevated to the status of co-heir, held secure. Thus, Paul writes that we are hidden with Christ in God. He even calls us new creations, stretching our imagination to see our life in Christ as a remaking. Our proximity to God is so intimate, Peter even says that we become participants of the divine nature. 2 Peter 1, go look it up. All of this is beautifully portrayed in one visual space in this icon known as the Anastasis. It holds Christ's defeat of death and sin together with his resurrection. Jesus literally wears new life, pictured by his white robe, and he stands victorious on the broken doors of Hades. As Revelation says, he holds the keys of death. But who is it that Jesus holds by the wrists? Some obscure Old Testament figure? No, he grips Adam and Eve pulling them up and out of their tombs and into new life with him, the icon invites us to see ourselves in their faces. There we are, pulled into Christ and into new life with him. The new life we experience in proximity to God in Christ, the sense that our world opens up, that we glimpse ourselves truly in God, All this may cause us to think that life with God is now complete. It isn't. Stretching out yet in front of us is our pilgrimage, our life of following Jesus in the power of God's Spirit. In Caravaggio's masterpiece here, The Calling of St. Matthew, he paints Matthew still in his chair, dumbstruck, pointing at himself. Who? Me, the incongruity, the mismatch between the gift and who he knows he is, dumbfounds him. But he will eventually stand and follow, and so must we. 
John 15, abide in me as I abide in you. Jesus said, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. The Christ gift as grace creates proximity to God and entails our pilgrimage of obedience. Acceptance of the gift pulls us into the current of Jesus' life, beckoning even as it enables us to make his priorities our own, embrace his rule of life, and see as he sees. Now, we wish, of course, that by receiving the Christ gift, our perception, our seeing, would be immediately and transformed. Don't we? That our twisted and hollow ways of seeing ourselves and the world and each other would be automatically straightened and deepened. But that isn't the case, is it? Uh, consider Paul's letter to Philemon. Uh, it appears that Philemon's slave, Onesimus, had run away. Uh, after fleeing, he comes into contact with Paul and is converted. Thus, Paul writes to Philemon about his return. Now, under Roman law, he could turn Onesimus in for execution. Paul pleads that he would not. And his plea rests on this. Philemon's perception of Onesimus must be transformed. Given that Onesimus is now in Christ, Philemon's old imagination must be dismantled. Paul writes, perhaps the reason he was separated with you for a little while was that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, better than a slave, a dear brother. He is very dear to me, even dearer to you, as a fellow man and as a brother in Christ. The socioeconomic arrangement of slave and owner that had marginal had organized their mutual perception is now void life under grace recasts the christian's perceptual frame but it isn't automatic in the sense of some divine download dismantling their old imagination requires participation they must Climb out of Matthew's chair, we might say. Uh, similar instructions were given to Christians living in the region of Galatia. Uh, Paul wrote to them saying, In Christ Jesus, you're all children of God through faith. It doesn't sound so surprising yet. And then he says this, There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. <sighs> Whatever economic or ethnic ladders they had climbed up to look down on each other were gone. What signifies their status under grace is no longer economic, slaves and free, gendered, male and female, nor is it ethnic, Jew or Gentile. They must all be purged to see each other truly. Brothers and sisters in Christ. Final example, my favorite. In every gospel, the news of the resurrection is entrusted first to women. Uh, the Greco-Roman culture of the day saw women basically as their husband's property, uh, and Jewish law considered them unfit to bear witness in court. And yet, God entrusts women to bear witness to the resurrection woven into the narratives of the Gospels, these earliest Christian readers, maybe us as well, receive a calling here. Your gendered imagination has to be dismantled. Your perception has to be healed. And in John's Gospel, it comes to us so personally. Mary of Magdala, she encounters angels at the empty tomb, and she just weeps. She says, They've taken my Lord away. I don't know where they've put him. She turns, she sees Jesus, but she doesn't recognize him. I mean, is John subtly inviting the reader to see themselves in Mary? That like her, our capacity for seeing Jesus and seeing like Jesus has to be awakened? Even after hearing him speak, she doesn't recognize him. 
It's only when she hears her name. The word that marks her in the world as a person, not as a, as a member of a class or some category. He says, Mary. And she sees. Now, if I had my way, being quite honest, I could just end here. But something harder is required. In our time and in our place as American Christians, our graced pilgrimage requires the dismantling of our racialized imagination. Some may think, ah, that's right and good, ah, but not essential to our theology of grace. No, I believe that it is. The shape of the Christian life according to the grammar of grace requires it. So this final part, graced transformation of racialized perception. The truth of the following statement has been so widely shown, I'm just not going to defend it. The category of race has no biological foundation. Let me start over. The category of race has no biological foundation, but we inherit it nonetheless. And without our conscious approval, it fundamentally shapes our vision for each other. If that's a new idea, uh, or if you just remain unconvinced of it, that's entirely fine. I recommend the work of Robert Jones, J. Cameron Carter, Ken Witzma, Charles and Ra, Willie Jennings. I've provided a handout with a bibliography and there's a reading list on the back. Willie Jennings of Yale University writes that Christianity in the Western world lives and moves within a diseased social imagination. He's talking about what I just stated. He explains, people from vastly different regions histories, ways of life, through the optic of race, imagine themselves or imagine others as part of a white race or a black race or something in between. Operating without our conscious approval, our racialized way of seeing prioritizes and baptizes whiteness. Jennings therefore calls for a baptism. Uh, we must confront, he argues, our diseased, racialized perception, confront, and then renounce it, which is the pattern of baptism. <laughs> the one being baptized turns their back, literally in many traditions, turns their back from their old way of life, which is called renunciation, and then turns their face toward new graced life in Christ. In, like I said, many traditions, literally turning. And in many churches... They will position a small baptismal font right at the entrance of the sanctuary so that as you come in and go out, you're reminded of baptism's pattern. Renounce your old life, turn toward the new. Jennings explains, race is like a large cloth that covers several complex interlocking machines with thousands of circuits that run through every aspect of our lives. We must understand the creative processes covered over by racial identity and then engage in the subtle and finely tuned operation of renunciation. We must move beneath this cloth and confront the machines. Some of these machines must have their circuits rerouted. Others must be destroyed. Others may never be destroyed by the church. But we must rage against them. The work of renunciation within confronting the racial condition returns us to the renunciation as part of the rite of baptism. Although renunciation surely points to a central work of confession in the gesture of turning away, it builds directly from the decision to follow Jesus and to live inside his repentance, his own turning away. Jennings locates our calling, our pilgrimage, solidly within our life in Christ, proximity, as repentance and renunciation that he enables by his spirit. 
to describe what this requires of us. Esau Macaulay uses the gift grief, uses the words of grief and mourning. Uh, Mourning is intuition that things are not right, that more is possible, he explains. But mourning is not enough. (laughs) Macaulay continues, we must have a vision for seeing something different. Justice is that difference. Jesus then calls us for reconfiguration of the imagination in which we realize the options presented to us by the world are just not all there is. There remains a better way, and that better way is the kingdom of God. He wants us to see that his kingdom is something that's possible, end quote. Now, uh, that vision of the kingdom that Macaulay evokes here, that sounds right to me. But I fear that those of us, me included, who are white American Christians, we will seize upon the hopeful vision without first the mourning. We may wish to bypass the painful silence, silence required of us to face our racial perception. The temptation is real to receive the Christ gift while avoiding what pilgrimage costs. To marvel at its incongruity without following the Spirit's lead into the places in our spirit where the painful work of healing is worked on us. Howard Thurman, he's been working me over lately. (laughs) He once wrote that religion often appears to exacerbate racism rather than resolve it by encouraging division rather than unity. Why? It's not wide open to the spirit of the living God. Openness to the spirit of the sort Thurman describes will involve some pain. The spirit will work on us. The death, which is the first part of sharing in Christ's baptism. That's how Paul describes it. White American Christians. This is hard to say. White American Christians may seek to avoid such openness by labeling the whole endeavor identity politics, virtue signaling, the social gospel, or among the educated, neo-Marxism. And thereby fuel our conviction of innocence and escape the demand. Concerning racism, I am not in any way suggesting the circularity of grace requires only our openness to the Spirit. So much more is required. I just don't feel equipped to offer it. Yet, offering our racialized imagination, offering our racialized imagination to the Spirit, opening ourselves wide to the Spirit is, I believe, unavoidable for pilgrimage. It is essential to getting up and out of Matthew's chair. Failing to see each other truly, we have little chance of being in relationship truly. So, you know, academic lectures, and I've given a bunch of them, (laughs) they don't typically end in prayer. Um, But I wish to let Howard Thurman pray for us tonight. Accept the offering of our lives, O God. (laughs) We don't know quite what to do with them. And so we place them before thee as they are, (laughs) encumbered and fragmented, with no hints, no suggestions, no attempts to order the working of your spirit upon us. (laughs) Accept our lives, our Father, Work them over. Correct them, purify them, hold them in your focus, lest we perish and the spirit within us dies. Amen. Amen.
Sure. Yeah. Yeah, am I, are you asking me to interpret Barclay or be me? I wondered if you see it as uh, you guys are continuing that or if you're veering off from some of Bart's positions and also Barclay is, are you in his wake or are you going a different direction? I think in general, I'm probably in Barclay's wake, at least in the way he interprets Paul. Um, Barclay ends up being uh, not so much a pioneer for me anyway, just more, more a vantage point to gain some language for talking about what we see in Paul in terms of grace. Um, I mean, Bart, I, I don't want to get into a specialist conversation with a group full of non-specialists, but Bart was, Bart was so fearful, so fearful to denigrate, to lessen, to deplete in any sense the sheer gratuity of grace that he was so fearful we'd have anything to contribute. Uh, and, and some of that, he does this, you know, John Webster's study of Bart's fourth volume, uh, The Ethics of Reconciliation, he shows so well that for Bart, there just isn't, there isn't any, um, there's no conflict between divine agency, like what God's up to in the world as God, and what we do in the world as humans, that those two things don't conflict. They're different kinds of agents that work in the world. And so for Bart's ethics, I, and underneath a lot of it, is he's just not fearful to talk about God working in the world and humans being a part of that work. Uh, and I think in that sense, anyway, I probably follow Bart. Um, although I would never call myself like a, a Bartian or something like that. He's been, he's been a helpful teacher, but um, that part in particular of Bart that I saw it transmitted to me through John Webster, who I studied with in Aberdeen, uh, is probably the piece that I take most from, at least in relation to this. Yeah, it's a great question. Wow. The things I wasn't ready to talk about. It's great. Love that. Mm. Stuff to think about. Thanks, Kevin. So, Dr. Eilers, thank you for your talk. Uh, you mentioned that God is not like Santa. Santa has a list. God has a book. The book of life. Songs have been written about it. That, that, and, and that's, uh, the reality of that is part of our understanding of the Christian faith. Um, how do you reconcile that with this, this picture of the perfect grace? Is that one, that, that, that's got to be one of the, one of the issues that theologians wrestle with. Yeah, let me take a crack at it and see if I'm heading in the right direction. Um, I take book of life language and scripture to be metaphor. Um, I'm not imagining a piece of paper that God's holding with certain kind of glued or sewn bindings up in heaven somewhere. So book is metaphor for what? Uh, I take book to be metaphor as God, we're not lost to God. So what does we are not lost to God relate to in terms of grace? Is that maybe the question or is it something different? Yeah, um, there's a kind of tension, at least in Paul, that different theologians over the Christian tradition have taken different directions uh, in terms of whether or not one can be secure in their faith or something like this. Is that underneath some of this? Or is it something different? Yeah. Hmm. Thank you so much for speaking on grace and for sharing a few insights of your book. I hope yeah, you go Yeah, I'm, I'm exploring some new directions here, so <laughs> yeah, thanks yeah. for tolerating that. Yeah. Um, I 
really appreciate your distinction between how although grace is not earned, it in some sense um, awakens, is that the word you said? Awakens mm-hmm. a response from mm-hmm. us. And um, the big lingering question that I have that maybe your experience as a pastor can, can help answer is um, in a very complacent evangelical Christian culture that we're living in, how do you suggest we um, kind of break this pattern that we are in of falling asleep to our um, imperative to act on our faith and to um, respond to the grace that's been given to us um, in how we live our life and the the pilgrimage that we're on. How, like in complacent Christian cultures, can we break that pattern and like actually do something? Yeah, I mean, I guess it it sounds lame to say it this way, but that's kind of, I think it's, you've got to heard scholars say this before, and I thought that was kind of lame, and now I find myself wanting to say it. That's sort of what I'm trying to work on here, <laughs> you know? Um, like, I've practiced talking to people for years. You're like, oh, it sounds terrible. I kind of love it. I actually, like the giving of a paper, I sort of love the whole performance of the thing. So, I mean, does grammar matter to me? <laughs> Intensely. I really want to be understood, and I want to kind of carry you along with me in the process, so it kind of matters to me how I put the words together. Oh, if Christians cared so much about grace as that kind of grammar. So I'm kind of, I mean, I'm trying to like say, like, can we just get more fluent about what grace actually is in our lives? Uh, and so if it is something that's incongruous and circular, then it's like this gift of the Spirit in us that's awakening our turn, return at every minute, which to me sounds something like less complacent. That's, that's my first thought. Yeah, good question, Ashley. Thanks, Ken. Uh, I have a couple pieces to this. Um, first, with the non-circularity, uh, that doesn't seem to me to take into account the nature of love and love's demand. Hmm. Like, you don't just love at a being. It's a desiring of them, right? Mm-hmm. You're, not, you're not willing to accept separation. So I see grace as fitting into that picture, right? God is having created within himself in some way a need for us in the act of creation, right? Mm. So we are his work and he is reaching out and then right, grace is what he gives us in order to uh, reach back. I probably would differ from you on that point that God needs in some sense in that way. We could have that conversation later. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I would then take that and then apply it to the second point Um, the concept of reaching out to an other Mm. so let's suppose that race was actually a biological category like would that matter to a loving being I don't think it would so even if we had this kind of division after all you mentioned the division between male and female and that seems to be biological and then within the grammar of grace that ends up not mattering, right? So the concept of race, um, let's suppose that there is something, you still are, like, love would still demand that you would reach across, that you would need the other. Yeah. That you would end up looking for more. So I... Um, That's like every other page of Robert Thurman. I mean, Howard Thurman, yeah. Right. Yeah, okay. his the luminous, the, the luminous darkness is like every other page. The recent lecture I listened to him, uh, Love or Perish, is like that in every other word. Um, I'm not trying, all I'm trying to do is just generate a a deeper sense of awareness that the the kind of racialized perception that we're trying to struggling with right now in our time uh, is not altogether different than some of these other things we see in scripture in in terms of like New Testament perception, some of the matters of perception that were being dealt with by Paul. So I'm just trying to make that connection so that it feels like less of a add on like we're doing these things over here, which seem right to us, but we should probably add that too. I'm trying to make it more essential, which is something I didn't I didn't set out to figure out a way to talk about race in terms of grace. That wasn't the project. Right. It was that it. I sort of ended up there at part four of the paper almost. Okay. Yeah. yeah. 
great. Thanks. Yeah, so much more needs to be said. Those are great questions. Mm. Mm. Please recall that faculty are invited to a reception in the library immediately following. And uh, any students that need a code for chapel credit, that is W, 9, 4, M is in Mary. And you can come see me if you didn't catch that, and I'll make sure that you get that. And let's thank Dr. Iowers once again, please. Well, I mean, it's just the nature. It's the nature of the thing. I got three audiences tonight, which is what makes this. I know how to talk to academics. I know how to talk.